Hello students, uh, this is Brock Skaggs and we're going to make this video today where we're going to analyze the beam and loading you see before us here. And so, as far as the beam and loading, you can see it's a simply supported beam. You've got the fixed pin connection at the left hand side, we'll call point A there. We've got the roller on the right hand side at point B, rolling on a horizontal surface. And then we have this concentrated point force at exactly the midpoint of the beam there. Um, we're going to keep everything in variables here, so instead of calling that force 1,000 pounds or 200 newtons, we're just going to leave that as some force F. And we have the entire length of the beam as a variable as well, uh, some length L there, instead of saying it's 10 meters or 10 feet or whatever. And so the goals of our analysis is going to be uh, to come up with the shear force and bending moment diagrams or plots uh, for this beam and loading there. And so basically we're going to try to plot how the shear force has changed as we move along the length of the beam as well as the bending moment as well. And so how are we going to do this? Well I've got a, a solution method already drawn out there. Uh, step one we're going to determine the reactions there. And so um, we should use a free body diagram there and also the equilibrium equations in order to figure out what the reactions are at points A and B where the beam is actually connected into uh, the ground. And then step two, we're going to draw free body diagrams of individual beam sections here. And so here, instead of drawing a free body diagram of the entire beam, we're going to take portions of the beam and we're going to draw a free body diagram of just the portion itself and then use equilibrium equations because we know if the entire beam is in static equilibrium, each little portion or segment of the beam also be in it, must be in static equilibrium there. And so that will be the methodology we use in order to obtain the expressions or equations which relate the internal shear force and internal bending moment to the position along the length of the beam. And so uh, that will be probably the uh, most critical step there, uh, step number two and 2A. And then after we have those equations, uh, drawing diagrams will be very simple. Um, if you have a computer algebra system or a graph and calculator, it just be a matter of plugging in uh, those known equations now um, with the specific domains and plotting those. And so uh, that's how we're gonna attack this problem in a nutshell. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. And so the first thing we're gonna do is determine reactions. And so I'll just go ahead and get my marker going here and the way we're going to determine the reactions is by drawing a free body diagram of the entire beam and so if we kind of get this thing going first thing we're going to do is draw a free body diagram and this free body diagram is going to be the entire beam and so what would that look like well just going to be a rectangle will be our beam here so there's the beam and we're drawing the free body diagram of the entire beam, so we're cutting it away from its supports here. And so what would we see? Well, at the left-hand side here, you've got point A, it's a pin connection, so we'll represent that with two components. We have an A sub Y reaction force possibly, as well as an A sub X reaction force there. And so these are both the components, the X and Y components of the reaction force at the pin connection. If we jump to the other side of the beam at point B here, um, we've got a roller on a horizontal surface. Uh, hopefully you remember your static, that's gonna generate a reaction force that is perpendicular to the surface orientation. So we've got a horizontal surface that's gonna be a vertical force. And so we'll have this um, B sub Y here. And so those are the forces associated with the reactions. And then we have the externally applied force F, of course, pushing down into the middle of the beam. And so we'll go one step farther here and put some dimensions in here. That F is at L over two. And of course the entire length of this beam is L units long there. And so this beam is gonna be in static equilibrium. And so we have our equilibrium equations that we can use in order to figure out these three unknown reactions. And those being A sub X, A sub Y, and B sub Y of course at this point. And so let's go ahead and start with the sum of the forces in the X. So we'll go sum of the forces in the X. Well, that's just going to be A sub X. And we know that's got to equal zero there because it's in static equilibrium. Uh, notice A sub X is the only force or component of a force that's pointed in the horizontal direction. So we know that A sub X is going to vanish. At this point, I've got two equations. I've got a sum of the force in the Y equation I could write as well as the sum of the moments point. Uh, here, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the moment one just so I can eliminate one of these two unknowns. 
And so I'm going to go ahead and take the moment about point A. And so my sum of the moments about point A here, positive counterclockwise is the convention that I'll use. And we can write out this moment equation. Usually when you uh, pick a point to do the moments about, you want to pick the point that has the most unknowns associated with it. And so at this point, it would have been equally good to pick point B or point A. Both of those would allow you to eliminate one unknown and solve for the other. And so we picked point A. And so AY and AX go through the point we're talking about, so we don't have to worry about that. First thing we hit as we move from left to right is force F. And so force F does not go through the point we're taking the moment about, so it's going to have a contribution into this moment equation. And so also we think about which way is this trying to rotate uh, the beam about my point. There's my point A there. And so it's pointing downwards, so that's going to try to cause clockwise rotation, so it's going to be a negative moment. And it'd be negative F times the perpendicular distance, if you want to think of it that way. And so it's minus F times L over 2 there in order to get the contribution into the moment equation of the externally applied force F. And so we keep going, we hit B sub Y. B sub Y is trying to cause counterclockwise rotation. And so it's plus here. And the moment would be what? B sub Y times L. And we have to set that equal to zero. And so if we look at this, um, immediately I can say, hey, if I can divide this equation out by L, since each of the terms has L there. And then I can solve for B sub Y. And so B sub Y here, what is it going to equal? Well, I just kick that to the other side. It'll be F over 2. And so the upward reaction with the roller has a magnitude of F over 2, or half the overall load. And so just as your intuition is probably telling you, everything's symmetric about the midpoint. Um, most likely, you would think, hey, A sub Y and B sub Y, they're going to be equal upward reactions and that's going to have the overall load, well that's going to end up being true and we can show that formally by writing our sum of the forces in the y equation. And so here taking forces going upward as positive you would have a sub y plus b sub y minus f and we know that's got to equal zero. And so now that we know b sub y, we know f of course, we can solve for my a sub y, my last unknown. So a sub y would be f minus b sub y We'll just substitute now what we know for B sub Y, that was F over 2. And we end up at F over 2 as well. And so, at this point, we have completed step 1 up there. Uh, determine reactions, if you want to, we can say yes, we've done that. Uh, because we know that A sub X is 0, and A sub Y and B sub Y are both equal to F over 2, and they're both directed upward as well. And so, we've got the reactions figured out. Now we move on to step 2 and we're drawing free body diagrams of individual beam sections here. And so the first thing you gotta think about is, well, how many diagrams do I need to draw? What are the sections? And so let's go back up to our initial picture here uh, to talk about that. And so when I draw these free body diagrams for this part of the problem, I always make my cut on the left-hand side at the very end of the beam here. And so there's one boundary, if you will, of the first free body diagram I'm going to draw. And so, uh, also, just in case I don't mention it, this left-hand spot, the very far left of the beam, is generally where I place the origin. And so that's going to be x equals 0 here. And the positive x-axis is going to go off to the right, as usual. And so, basically what you need to do is be able to draw as many different free body diagrams as possible. And by different, I don't necessarily mean just the length. I mean, here I could have one whose length is L over 8 and then L over 4 and 3 8 L, um, those would all be uh, the same free body diagram in this case. Uh, just because what I'm having here is that the X position is going to be related as a variable and so we'll just keep that as generic as possible and so we'll have some length X here uh, but notice if I make the cut before I get to the midpoint I have a beam segment here where the only loads are expressed through the pin connection here. There's no externally applied load there. And so that would be my first type of free body diagram I can draw. And so that's going to relate to one set of shear force and bending moments. And then you think, okay, if I keep growing this free body diagram, 
as far as you keep dragging this boundary off to the right, to the right, to the right, at some point it's going to change. And that change is going to be because, hey, I'm going to hit this externally applied force F. And so that's going to be the next free body diagram I'll have to draw. And so I'm keeping the same boundary on the left hand side, but now we're going to grow X to the point where we go past the midpoint. And notice now I've got a change because I've got to now include the externally applied force F there at the midpoint. And that would be my second free body diagram. And so I've got these two free body diagrams. Hopefully you can see one is in red, one is in blue. And those are the two free body diagrams that I'll use equilibrium equations in order to determine the equations for the shear force and bending moment. And notice this blue one here, if I keep moving this off to the right, to the right, to the right, nothing changes, right? It's not gonna see any new loads, there's not gonna be any new reactions until I get to the very end of the beam at x equals L. And so that's gonna be the idea behind step two here of the solution method. Basically you need to usually start at the very left hand side, that's the easiest place in my opinion to do it because you're always gonna be at the origin there and keep going to the right and see how many different free body diagrams you can draw and what's gonna be the difference here is gonna be a load's gonna be introduced or there could be a reaction introduced as well. And so just keep that in mind as you draw these sets of free body diagrams. And so with this particular problem, you can see we just need two, uh, but to say there was another force applied right here, then I would need a third one where my cut is on the right side of that force because there would be another set of equations that I would need to uh, develop. And so hopefully that's clear. Um, if not, hopefully it becomes more clear as we work through the example. And so the first thing I'll do is I'll switch back to the red ink here so we can associate it with my first free body diagram. And so the first thing you need to do is figure out what the domain of the X is going to be because I'm going to make this cut here through the material of the beam itself at some value X. But there's going to be restrictions on what value X can take. And for this beam to look like this, that's going to be that X has got to be greater than zero, but it's got to be less than L over two because we need it to stay to the left of the midpoint. And so that will be our restriction. I come down here, our free body diagram here is going to be where zero is less than X, which is less than L over two. And so we'll draw our chunk of beam here. We'll draw about yay long. And so the question is what loads are this segment of beam feeling? And so you have of course the pin connection here on the left hand side which is a sub y which is equal in magnitude to f over 2. I already saw that. We're making some cut at units x units long and here we'll call point X. But notice if X is between 0 and L over 2, there's not going to be any other externally applied load felt by that beam segment. And so we're almost done with the free body diagram. And almost, uh, hopefully you see it now, is you think about this beam segment and be like, hey, that can't be in static equilibrium. You've got a force going up, but there's nothing pushing down on it, right? Uh, this thing would try to translate upward, possibly rotate as well. Well, since we cut through the material of the beam itself, we need to draw our internal shear and internal bending moment here, uh, the V and M there. And so that should cause it to be in static equilibrium. And so here you can see A sub Y pushing up while V is going down. And you can think of the couple, A sub Y would try to spin this thing in the clockwise rotation. Well, M's there in the opposite rotation in order to make it go counterclockwise there. So that should have enough pieces to make it in static equilibrium. Another thing you might be looking at is saying, well, why did you draw B and M in that orientation? Well, that gets back to a sign convention, which I believe I have down here, yes, of a sign convention that we try to follow. And so this sign convention here that you're seeing is basically to ensure that a specific direction of internal shear force and bending moment on the free body diagram matches up with either a positive number or a negative number when we go to draw our shear force and bending moment plots there. And so the way this works out is if I make a cut through the middle of the beam here and I take the left hand side, which is what we did here, the V going downward and the M going counterclockwise are going to be considered positive internal shear force and positive internal bending moment. 
If you take the right hand side of the free body diagram cut, it goes in the exact opposite direction here. And so uh, just something to remember here so that our diagrams all look the same. And so generally I'll be taking the left hand side of the cuts and so generally when I draw internal shear force, internal bending moment, I first draw them like this because those are the positive directions with respect to my shear force and bending moment plots. And so with that being said, we now need to relate V and M here to the externally applied force F as well as the position along the length of the beam. And so that's relatively easy to do. Um, we just use our equilibrium equations. We know that this beam chunk is in static equilibrium. And so now we can use those equations in order to figure out V and M. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'll just say, okay, the sum of the forces in the Y direction, the vertical, you'd have A sub Y minus V must equal zero. And so of course we can use this to solve for V. Well, V is just going to equal A sub Y, really simple algebra. And we have A sub Y being equal to F over two there. And so what this tells us is that the internal shear force is a constant. It's equal to F over two over the first half of the beam between zero and L over two. And so we can do a very similar thing for the bending moment. I'll use the moment equation. We'll go counterclockwise rotations is positive. The point I'm going to work on is point X. Now the reason I pick point X is because the internal shear force V travels right through X, so it doesn't enter into this moment equation. And that way, in case I was to somehow mess up in this part of the problem, it wouldn't contaminate my bending moment part. And so if we write this equation out, go right to left this time, we of course have positive M. And then we would have minus A sub Y times X. And that's going to equal zero. Uh, of course, again, V goes through the point, so we don't have to worry about M, positive M. And then A sub Y is trying to cause clockwise rotation, so minus there, and it's A sub Y times X. Um, be careful here, because we're just keeping that position very general as possible here um, as a variable x instead of picking a specific value. And so this with, for this equation here, we can now solve for our m. So m is equal to a sub y times x. But what is a sub y? Well, it's just f over 2. And so it's f over 2 times x. And so here you can see the bending moment is not a constant over the first half of the beam. It's a linear function, right? It's linearly increasing, and the slope is f over 2. And so very good. Um, at this point, we're halfway done with developing the equations for internal, internal shear force and internal bending moment, right? We've got over the first half. And so that was all associated with the, the free body diagram where we're showing the kind of the boundaries of it in red there. So next we just draw a free body diagram, except we make it a little longer. And so I'll switch over to blue. But by a little longer, you can see the requirement here is that we've got to go past the midpoint and of course not past the length of the beam. And so this domain will be will be between x equals l over 2 and x equals l or essentially the right half of the beam and so we'll come down here draw our second set free body diagram here it's going to be between l over 2 is less than x which is less than l again we need a rectangle for our beam make it a little longer here and so here we think of the loads that this beam segment's going to experience. Um, well, we still have A sub Y on the left-hand side. So A sub Y here is equal to F over 2. Now here we've gone past the midpoint, and so at some point we're going to see this externally applied force F, and that's at a very specific point because that's at L over 2 units away from the left hand side of the beam. We said it is exactly at the midpoint. And remember here we're keeping the overall length of this beam segment as a variable x. If you want we can call this point here point x that we're taking the moments about. And so at this point we're right where we need to be. And we just need to now put in the internal shear force and internal bending moment. So we have a V here and an M, because remember we're cutting through the 
actual material of the beam itself. And so there could exist an internal shear force and bending moment, and we'll use our equilibrium equations now to relate them to the position along the length of the beam as well as the externally applied load. And so this is going to be the same process we did up here in red. We'll say, okay, the sum of the forces in the y direction would be positive a sub y minus f minus v is equal to zero. And so now again we can solve for v. And so v would be equal to a sub y minus f which is f over 2 for a sub y minus f, that's negative f over 2. See here it is a half minus 1, negative a half, negative f over 2. And then we'll do the same thing on the moments as we did before. Take the sum of the moments about point x, counterclockwise is positive. Here we'd have, working right to left, you'd have m. And then v, remember, goes through the point that we're trying to take the moment about, so we don't have to worry about it. F is going to try to cause counterclockwise rotation, so it's a positive contribution, plus F. What is that perpendicular distance? What's well, this distance right here? That's going to be X minus L over 2. And then as we work our way farther to the left, we have A sub Y trying to cause clockwise rotation about point X, so it's minus A sub Y times the full distance X. And that's got to all sum to zero because we know this thing is in static equilibrium there. And so now we can solve for m. And so m is equal to what? It would be negative f times x minus L over 2. Plus, instead of a sub y, I'll write it as f over 2 times x. And so we have what? We have negative fx plus f over 2 times x, so that's negative f over 2 times x, plus fl over 2. And so that is the equation for the internal bending moment over the right half of the beam between l over 2 and l. And so at this point we've kind of got our answer, if you will, uh, spread out quite a bit. Um, you've got part of the answer up here, part of the answer here, uh, part answer down here. And so one thing we can do is write these as piecewise defined equations. And so we can say things like, well, V is going to equal, well, it's going to equal two different values depending on where you're at. Um, over the first half, it's F over 2. Over the second half, it's negative F over 2. Instead of saying first half and second half, we'll say, well, this is good valid for when X is less then L over 2 and greater than 0. So 0 is less than X, which is less than L over 2. And on the second one, it's between L over 2 and L. And so this is the piecewise defined function, description, if you will, of the internal shear force as we move along the length of this beam. And then for the internal bending moment, you have what? It was F over 2 times X over the first half of the beam and over the second half we can see it's negative f over 2 times x plus fl over 2 and this was over the second half of the beam uh, if you think about this a little bit um, you can actually put less than or equal to for the bending moment here uh, the reason I'm able to do that is because there's no concentrated moments some externally applied concentrated moments either associated with the reactions or a externally applied load on this beam itself. So there's not going to be any discontinuities that you will see in the bending moment plot. Not the same with the shear force because there are there are, excuse me, externally applied concentrated forces but both the reaction as well as the force right at the middle there that's going to cause discontinuities there. And so um, what I've just boxed there would be the description of the internal shear force and the internal bending moment as we move along the length of the beam, um, all basically written as expressions or equations, if you will. And so that gets us to step two. Step two are done. Now it's easy. Step three, um, just draw the diagrams. And so I'll make some rough plots here below so we can just get a feel for what these things look like. Oops. It's like part of my screen.
screen got lost there, so I'll go ahead and put that back in. And so what are these going to look like? Well, the shear force will draw over here. And so here's B, here's X. And so immediately it's going to jump up to F over 2. And then at L over 2, something's going to happen. And so it jumps up to F over 2. That's valid for the first half of the beam. As soon as we get to the halfway point, it drops to negative F over 2. It drops by a magnitude equal to the ex externally applied point force, F. Then nothing happens until you get to the end. And basically it pops up to X equals L at that reaction on the right hand side associated with the roller there. And so there's the internal shear force. You can see you just have two constants over the left half and the right half of the beam. Now for the internal bending moment. Here's internal bending moment M, position X. Uh, some important points will be L over 2 and L. And so first thing, where does it start? Well, if I plug a 0 into F over 2 times X, uh, plug X equals 0 in, it starts at 0. Starts at the origin. If I plug in L over 2 to the X value here, you have FL over 4. And so this max value is going to end up being FL over 4, which is roughly right here. And how do you connect those points? Uh, that should be a nice straight line. It's a nice linear function, uh, positive increasing slope there. And so you can then look at the second one here. It is a linear function there. If it's the form y equals mx plus b. Um, if you plug in l over 2 there, you get negative fl over 4 plus fl over 2. It is fl over 4, so it does indeed start at this point right here. And then on the opposite end, the far right end, plug in x equals l, you have negative fl over 2 plus fl over 2, ends up being 0. And so there's that point, and it just comes right back down. It kind of makes that triangular shape there for the internal bending moment. And so at this point, I believe we have arrived at what we were trying to find. Um, we've got the drawings of the internal shear force, the internal bending moment as we move from x equals 0 to x equals L. Um, we've got the pictures as well as you can see the equations um, boxed there. And I believe that was the goal of this problem. And so thank you for watching the video. Uh, hopefully it'll help you draw your own shear force and bending moment diagrams.